एवरीवन दिस इज डॉक्टर विवेक गोयल एंड वेलकम टू द टेस्ट एंड डिस्कशन सेशन फॉर नेफ्रोलॉजी सो वी हैड द नेफ्रोलॉजी क्वेश्चंस इन टर्म्स ऑफ फोर मॉड्यूल्स सो लेट अस बिगिन विद द वेरी फर्स्ट मॉड्यूल व्हिच वाज मॉड्यूल नंबर 1 एंड दिस मॉड्यूल हैड योर एसिड बेस अबनॉर्मलिटीज योर इलेक्ट्रोलाइट्स सो इट बेसिकली हैड the acid base abnormality your electrolytes and your urinary testing and your urinary abnormality so to say mainly so these were the three important sub topics which were covered in module number 1 so the very first question was very easy and i have taken most of the questions from harrison 21st edition pertaining to the pattern of the neat ss the very first question was that the ratio of extravascular to intravascular fluid is dash the answer to this question is 3 is to 1 that is the extracellular fluid is further divided into intravascular and extravascular so the extracellular fluid is basically divided into extravascular and intravascular and it is in the ratio the intravascular fluid is only one proportion and the extravascular is the three proportion so the answer of extra vascular to intra vascular the answer will be 3 is to 1 this is a fairly basic question which we have studied in physiology but which is important the next question is linear relationship between osmolality and circulating avp occurs above threshold osmolality of so basically the question is that the relationship between the serum osmolality and the avp so above what osmolality when the osmolality further increases the avp increases and the answer to it is 285 milliosms per kg because the arginine vasopressin or so to say the ads the anti diuretic hormone is stimulated as the osmolality increases above the threshold of 285 milliosms per kg above which there is a linear relationship between osmolality and circulating avp again a basic question but very very important the next question which of these is a salt losing nephropathy is it a reflux nephropathy is it an interstitial nephropathy or a medullary cystic kidney disease now please understand the common between these three are they are all tubulo interstitial disorders so be it a medullary cystic kidney disease for that matter be it a ad adpkd beat an adtkd beat an in any interstitial nephritis beat a reflux nephropathy all of them of them will are tubular interstitial disorders and when they will progress to ckd the the phenotype is ctid or chronic tubulo interstitial disease chronic tubulo interstitial disease will ultimately affect the tubule and the interstitium and they will affect the ability of the tubulo interstitium to reabsorb salt and water and that is why they basically present with non oliguric renal failure because the nephron loses the ability to reabsorb water because of the tubular dysfunction and the patient loses water the patient has a good amount of urine so to say and also loses salt so this is kind of a state of a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus so to say and these are all salt losing nephrop because of chronic tubulo interstitial dysfunction the next question is a 50 year old man is brought to the emergency with altered sensorium the blood pressure was 138 by 86 so it is fairly normal there was no edema the sodium was 115 milli equivalents and the urinary sodium was 45 the differential diagnosis does not include which of the following so there was no edema so it is basically a hypovolemic or a euvolemic hyponatremia of course it is less likely hypovolemic because the blood pressure is quite stable the sodium is you no know, low and the urinary sodium is high which is not a probable answer hypothyroidism can cause siadh can be one of these cerebral salt wasting in cerebral salt wasting you expect hypovolemia you expect hypotension the next is glucocorticoid deficiency again can cause euvolemic hyponatremia and last but not the least siadh this is the prototype of euvolemic hyponatremia so the answer is cerebral salt wasting this is very very important very 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 important 
Now, please also understand that whenever you get a case of hyponatremia, let me discuss along with this the approach to hyponatremia. Whenever you get a case of hyponatremia, the first thing you do is check for serum osmolality. So the serum osmolality, if it is low, then it is a case of true hyponatremia. That is hypoosmolal hyponatremia. If the serum osmolality, if the serum osmolality is high, that is a case of hyperosmolal hyponatremia, which actually occurs in a patient of translocational hyponatremia, where an osmotically active substance may be present in the blood, which has caused the transcellular shift of water. And that can be in the case of excess of glucose. That can be when you have given a mannitol. That can be in presence of any hyperosmolar substance in the blood. If the serum osmolality is normal, that is known as pseudo hyponatremia because it is not a true hyponatremia it is actually a lab artifact due to the measurement via the indirect electrodes please understand this is a lab artifact this occurs when the solid component in the blood increases for example hyperlipidemia for example, hyperglobulinemia, like in multiple myeloma. For example, if you have administered the patient IVIG, so that can occur. Once you get a patient of true hyponatremia, that is serum osmolality is low, your next job is to do a urine osmolality. Why, sir? Sir, if the urine osmolality is less than 100 or if it is more than 100. Sir, if it is more than 100, then I can surely say that ADH is acting, ADH is present in the serum. Sir, if the urine osmolarity is less than 100, it means ADH is absent. It means there is no ADH. There is no ADH. Why, sir? Either you have had so much of water that you have suppressed the ADH totally like in the case of a polydipsia or you are consuming such a low solute diet that ADH is not able to act only. For example, a beer potomania. But if the ADH is present, that is if the urinary osmolality is more than 100, then the ADH is present. And if the ADH is present, then depending upon the volume status, the patient can be hypovolemic, euvolemic or hypervolemic. And depending upon the urinary sodium, it can be further divided. How? Just like this as we have been studying this table in the Harrison's. So I have told you the basic concept even before this. So in a hypovolemic hyponatremia, if the urine sodium is less than 20, it means that the body has lost sodium from an extra renal cause. For example, from vomiting, diarrhea, third spacing, pancreatitis, burns, trauma, etc. If it is more than 20, then it has lost a renal cause. The most cause of which is diuretics. It could be mineralocorticoid deficiency, salt losing nephropathy. It could be osmotic diuresis or a cerebral salt wasting. If the patient is euvolemic, as in the index question and the urinary sodium is more than 20, the most common cause is SIADH, but it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Then it could be drugs, it could be stress, hypothyroidism and glucocorticoid deficiency or hypocortisolism. If it is a hypervolemic hyponatremia, then if the urinary sodium is more than 20, then it is a renal cause, which is a renal failure. 
may be acute, may be chronic. But if the urinary sodium is less than 20, it's an extra renal cause. Could be due to the heart, that is heart failure. Could be due to the liver, liver cirrhosis or a nephrotic. This is how you approach. Now, in the index question, you had a true hyponatremia, but the urine sodium is, was more than 20, but the patient was uvolemic and normotensive. So the answer is SIADH, most common cause, could be hypothyroid, could be glucocorticoid, but this is cerebral salt wasting where you expect the BP to be low and you expect the urinary sodium to be high. And you expect a volume status which your wall patient will be volume depleted. The next question is, the recommended rise of serum sodium in 48 hours in a patient of chronic hyponatremia is in 48 hours, you expect the rise to be less than 18 millimoles. You don't expect the rise to be more than 18 milliequivalents per liter in a patient of chronic hyponatremia. Am I clear?